Peter's father had ordered a guerrilla unit to move forward up the coast to Paraso Bay to determine if it was a suitable position from which to establish a command base before moving out to attack the Japanese known to be in part of the island. It was a fine clear morning, with glassy water so smooth that Joseph stopped the boat so cell phone calls could be made back home to wives in New Zealand. Oh, the most beautiful coconut milk just dropped from the tree above. Here I am with my son Paul and my good friend Bob McCaw on Parasso Bay, the first landing area of the 37th Battalion. And they stayed here for a short period of time because they decided this wasn't going to be their base. Their base was going to be round the next bay which we'll go to in a moment, uh, which is Doe Valley Cove and Borrow. Having established their uh, beachhead round at Doe Valley Cove and Borrow, which is just round to my left, uh, the patrols then moved back into um, Parasso Bay and they blew up a major Japanese ammunition dump which is here somewhere in the jungle uh, or was in the jungle and if you look down to my right you'll see what may be a Japanese uh, we uh, can't identify it as whether it's Japanese or American or even New Zealand but they were continually bombed when they came back to Parasso Bay and uh, patrolled all this area Boy, and it's so hard to believe in such an idyllic cove like this that there was some major air battles all the time in the air and uh, the Japanese air attacks and the Japanese planes that came over and bombed Parasso Bay uh, and bombed our troops uh, were commonly known as washing machine Charlies. Moving out towards the cove here we'll move slowly round and you'll see our boat that we came up in. We just move out now and we head towards Doe Valley Cove where and borrow where the battalion established themselves for the next six months. The team left Parasso Bay for a short trip to Borough, the village area of which had been the forward base for the 37th, and they berthed alongside the remnants of the jetty built by the 37th, but now a children's play area. Which is Boro? This is Boro village. And that's Boro Bay. Right. So the, you people belong to Boro village? Yes. 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 They had been told a memorial existed up the hill. So following Rocky, a local villager, they found a plaque which had been placed there by members of the 3rd Division in April 1998. We're in Borough Village, which is in Doe Valley Cove. 
and Rocky, who we met, guided us up to this memorial, which we didn't know quite what to expect. But the memorial is two of our men from the 37th Battalion, Corporal Riddell and Private Rees. And they were both killed when they captured the Japanese lugger in Tabama Bay. Rocky, Rocky has joined us now. Thank you, Rocky, again for bringing us up to this moment. Uh, just an emotional moment to realise that suddenly we have got in front of us the memorial of two of our men from the battalion. We did not expect this. Uh, we uh, are going on to Tabama to find where the Japanese lugger was discovered and where these two men went on board and unfortunately they were shot by the Japanese and uh, didn't survive. It was now midday and the group moved back to their boat for the short trip up to La Vis village at Liangai. Here they were to meet an old coast watcher called Peter Poker. The battalion came up from Guaido Canal with 23 vessels and a destroyer mm -hmm. and came up and landed at Maravari. They didn't stay at Parasso Bay, they carried on to here, to Dovelli Cove, where they made their base. Then they went, the patrol went on up to Tabama. Where you, Tabama, where we go this afternoon. And that's where the lugger was taken. They were settled into their village accommodation, have lunch provided by villagers, and prepare for a major expedition in the afternoon. This would take them into the main area where the 37th had been in action against the Japanese. Following a lunch of succulent pineapple and coconut milk, the group departed for Tambama Bay. This would take them around the northernmost point on the island to the scene of one of the most spectacular actions involving the fighting soldiers of the 37th. The boys demonstrated their boating skills guiding their way through coral shallows of crystal clear water and past crocodile invested mangroves. carried on now from Boro and we've gone further up the coast and we're now at Tambama Bay and this is where the Japanese lugger was captured by the 37th Battalion. I have with me a scout from the uh, that was helping the 37th Battalion, Peter Poker. He remembers the war, he remembers the New Zealand forces and he's going to point exactly where the lugger was captured. Yes. Yeah. Well, I think the significance of this war is that these men had to fight in such claustrophobic areas as jungle. They couldn't see the enemy. The enemy behind, behind trees, and the Japanese were very, very good at climbing trees. Well, you can imagine Lieutenant Barnes in this jungle here, looking out towards the lugger. He says, we looked out and there, heavily camouflaged by green foliage, 
was a Japanese lugger making its way past a point in the bay to my left. We could hear them talking before they opened fire, with far heavier equipment than ours. After terrifying wait, our platoon moved towards the lugger to find the crew had gone ashore, leaving the boat deserted without guard. The platoon climbed on board, took over the 20mm guns and waited for the Japanese to return. They opened fire as they returned. The Japanese were asked to surrender but supplied quickly but replied by opening fire. Those that did not fall victims were dealt with by our temporary allies, the crocodiles, he said. The platoon then went ashore and cleaned up the stragglers. Seventeen Japanese were killed and we lost two of our men, Private Rees and Corporal Riddell. Arms, food and clothing was kept by four landing craft. Peter, where was the heavy fighting be with the lugger? In here. We're going to get up here. They decide to the, 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 the the come this way. The Japanese come this way. They force them back here. Okay, I'm not dinky. I'm not dinky. I'm not dinky. But two New Zealanders already there on the Lanka. On the lugger? Yes. Yeah. So time all Japanese coming. Oh, America, America, and bang. One of the Japanese soldiers, so American, 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 so they already bound. So one, those were lost there. One New Zealand uh, army, army go, and bang, 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 and we're going to go across to the right here to where the New Zealand camp was in the bay. And that's where they would have first sighted the barge. And that's where the New Zealand troops jumped on the barge. Peter, where was the barge? Later, we were barge and water. I'll show you about it. The party boarded their boat for the short trip to Warrenbury, site of the final but vicious battle against the Japanese. By now the pincer movement involving the 37th and 35th battalions was about to close. Ray Monaro, in his history of the 35th, outlines the final action against the Japanese. The following is a paraphrased summary of his writing. On the same day the lugger was captured by the 37th, two detachments of the 35th Battalion had reached Makwana Bay, next to Warrenbarri and was closing in on the main Japanese position. Initially surrounded by the Japanese, they fought doggedly for six days and nights holding out the enemy as he came into attack with hand grenades, rifles and machine guns. Scurrying from tree to tree, the Japanese yelled and shouted, sometimes in English, as they held their grenades, but each attack was fought off. By September 30th, the men were showing signs of weakness, but only because they were short of food and water. Morale was still high. Not a man complained. They buried their dead and made stretches for the wounded men from vines and branches. Eventually, the garrison was rescued, but not before six men had been killed and eight wounded. We've moved up again, up the coast further from Tambama Bay with my friend Peter and he's going to point to where this, there was some most vicious fighting here. We're in Warrenbari Bay. Uh, and where was the fighting, Peter? Yeah. You'll notice that the jungle comes right down to the water's edge and the most fierce fighting that the battalion suffered was in this area. Way from the north, headed down this way from the north, and the assault boats arrived and navigated the reefs coming in into the Warrenbury Bay. Our the patrol boats were unloaded probably where we are now. Um, and each boat containing one platoon plus two ration, days rations. Headquarters were established here. 
The Japanese were sighted and patrols commenced into the almost impenetrable jungle. Dad writes, the Japanese had secured an excellent position amongst the logs, trees and roots and were past masters at climbing trees and sniping. Reinforcements arrived and fighting continued. Twenty Japanese were killed but sadly five of our men were killed and six wounded. More Japanese were concentrated to the north and south to Warrenbari. Our troops now had 15 days of living out of foxholes and dugouts. Dysentery was setting in, but morale was still high. Three more of our soldiers were killed while flushing out the Japanese. Air raids continued and patrols searched the coast to Mendy Point. After 18 days of continuous fighting, contact with the enemy ceased and they evacuated the island on the night of the 6th of October 1943. Our casualties were 10 men killed and 7 wounded. Dad writes, that they had ended 18 days of arduous patrolling, not knowing what lay ahead in the impenetrable jungle and mangrove swamps. They were continually wet and sharing the land crabs in stinking muddy holes. The campaign was now over. By the 5th of October, the enemy garrison had been forced back into an area between Wairambari and Makwana Bays. Torrential rain fell and enemy aircraft kept up a constant patrol over the area so that the New Zealand guns were unable to maintain a prolonged bombardment. The following night, while the two battalions were preparing for a final assault, the encircled Japanese, numbering about 500, were evacuated by barge, two destroyers which were waiting off the north of the island. But the enemy did not escape successfully. Three American destroyers attacked the Japanese convoy and sank many of the barges that had evacuated the men. 77 of the enemy were fished out of the sea the following day. By the 9th of October, when patrols from the two battalions met at 10.33am and made a final reconnaissance of the area, all Japanese resistance was considered at an end. For the next two months, the battalion remained on garrison duty covering Warrenbari Bay to Mendi and Karaka points, guarding against any further landings by the Japanese. The captured Japanese lugger was renamed Confident and was used to ferry more supplies from, Ma from Maravari and three more wrecked Japanese barges were towed ashore, patched up and put into commission to ferry soldiers and supplies back and forth from Maravari. Boro became a very busy port. The party returned to Liangai in somewhat sober mood and they were joined by a pod of small dolphins. However, Peter had one more story to tell so Joseph stopped the boat close to Sandy Tolia Point. Yes, there was a tragic occurrence here in, uh, on the 5th of December 1943. The Padre came out from Tabama Bay out to, uh, to the point here, which is uh, Sur, Na Sur Anatolia uh, Point, and he got caught on the reef here in his boat, the Padre and two, two, um, two soldiers. And they were... Uh, <laughs> identified by, by the Americans as Japanese, they thought they were Japanese, so they bombed them and they fired on them and they killed two of the, the Padre wasn't killed, but the two soldiers on board were killed. So they were virtually killed by friendly fire. And friendly fire was not uncommon during the war in the Pacific. The, the men weren't from the uh, 37th Battalion, but they were a supportive group. They were a group from the 20th Field Company that were here and they were supporting and working with the battalion right from the commencement of their, uh, from their work in Vela de Vela. That evening the group swam, dried their clothing and watched Lavist and Lovo work to provide the Europeans with toilet facilities which they were used to. Normally one needs a stick to beat off the fish when wading into the tide, but they were provided with the latest long drop off the balcony. Privacy was provided with transparent fishing net. 